I have done a lot of research for this series and of course I try to boil it down <laughs> to give you really the pure information in a nutshell without writing a complete book with a thousand pages. Okay, what I want to do here today is to clear a little bit the term a linear. And when we talk about HDRI, we talk normally about a linear data, linear light data, to make it more precise. And the confusion between linear, linear, linear light and so on, linear workflow, is pretty large. And I have to admit, when I went to some tutorials, I thought, oh my god, they should really read some material about what's all about, because it's not that simple. But finally, it is as well very simple. <laughs> when you do it right. And to help you to do that, I want to talk a little bit about. And please just throw away everything that you know so far about linear, because that's maybe a term that doesn't work very well. And so I use for anything with quality linear light instead, because the term linear is so often used in a wrong way. Here I have a raw image Raw means here that we get the data that the sensor produces in the camera one to one. And to get this data finally in the HDRI calculation, we need to have everything zeroed out. We don't want to have anything inside of our settings that would adjust something. The worst part, of course, to go out of the linear light mode is to use here the highlights, which is just a fake. And a fake in terms of it uses information that was not clipped in the picture. We have R, G and B channels. And most likely one of these channels has a little bit information left. Then Adobe or other companies take this information and map that on the other channels here. That means finally we lose the color of the highlights because they are never really white. They have always a tint, a color, something like that. And when we change here exactly this value in the highlights, for example, we move data that is clipped normally back into this area here. And that distorts the whole linearity here, of course. That's the first big mistake. So whenever you work with HDRI production, the highlights has to be on zero. We don't want to have any artificial recovered stuff inside of our images. Even if we get more dynamic out of it, we distort the whole data finally. So the highlights a big no in HDRI processing if you work for 3D. And again, I get not tired to make here a big differentiation between photographers for pictures, for nice pictures, and for 3D HDRI where we want to have light information in the purest form represented from the world. Okay, that's the first step. And all the other values here don't touch them. And as well, no sharpening. Sharpening adds color or black and whites into the picture. A big no when you want to have pristine information for your HDRI. The linearity in a local space is in danger when you put sharpening in it because it puts a lot of data into it to make the edges more prominent. This is not a real sharpening. It's something that works not very precisely. And you have to put in mind what we do here is a debayering operation. That means we come from our sensor, which has only green, red and blue pixels, to an image that has per pixel red green and blue at the same time. So there's an interpolation and there comes the blurriness into the whole game. So the sharpness, it's a big no as well. Just leave it where it is. The next step is here, that curve. Never use that for HDRI for 3D. 
big now. And then we have here, of course, these values. Also, don't touch them. <laughs> it's pretty simple, straightforward. Don't touch anything and you are fine. And then you leave everything in the way it is. The only thing that I would suggest, and we come to this point, use the widest gamut color profile possible to not squeeze pixels into a small color profile to get something done. And then we have here, of course, other areas where I would think don't do it. When you go here maybe to camera faithful, camera landscape or neutral portrait, you get always a different colorization here inside. So neutral is your friend. Even in the camera, always put everything to the least amount of change. Then you get something. And you have seen, when we change here something, we change it inside of our levels here. And any change is a distortion from the original linearity of the file. Okay, I think I made my point clear here. We use the material as it is, because the algorithm who produces HDRI will go then and take this information in the best way. There is a difference when we use JPEGs, and I want to show you the danger of JPEGs in a sec. So the question is, of course, when you have a camera raw image and you have a JPEG from your camera, from your DSLR, how is the JPEG produced? What is the JPEG in comparison to the camera raw? And why I wouldn't suggest at all to use JPEGs? For photography purposes, the HDRI can be produced with a JPEG, of course, but when we want to have precise values, we should stay with RAW. So how is the JPEG finally produced inside of the camera? First of all, we have a debayering process going on, because the camera by itself has not the resolution that it pretends to have. It has only an R and G value, then a G and a B value. And then we have four pixels and they get interpolated to finally have all these RGB values for each pixel then. So that's the first fake. We have only two-thirds of a resolution, to say it roughly, in a picture. But we go with that because there's no other way other than to have very specialized sensors, which we don't find that often. They exist. The next step is then that the JPEG should be more like an image that we get from our one-hour photo lab. <laughs> it should be nice and shiny for everyone who wants to see the picture. So what is the camera doing to the raw data then finally to output a JPEG? And I have open here the picture style editor for my Canon 5D. And normally we wouldn't see something like that. We see here maybe landscape, portrait or something like that. I stay here with neutral and I want to show you what normally happens. And I do it very extremely. I go here to that curve and go here to that point. And this is more or less how the old celluloid, the film, worked. We had here a more or less straight line and then a shoulder and a knee or a toe if you want. Toe straight and shoulder. And the knee here in the top area is pretty much when we roll out the highlights. The toe here is when we have a lot of dark values but we don't want to spend too much attention or differentiation values for our JPEG because JPEGs are pretty limited in terms of differentiation among all the tonal values. So the more we go into a flat horizontal way here and on the top, the more dynamic and differentiation and contrast we get here in the middle part where we have our main attention normally. And so a JPEG has normally this curve in it. It's not only that we have something like this in the picture, the gamma curve. And we come to the gamma curve in a later episode in the series, because that's a dangerous thing to have if you don't recognize that it is 
inside of the picture already. So the S-curve and the gamma curve are two things that becomes a gray label in the JPEG. And when you use JPEGs then finally in the HDRI production, this needs to be calculated out and we get some rounding errors that we wouldn't get from all of the real linear pictures in it. So I can create here, of course, picture profiles when I say I don't want to have this tone here in my picture all the time. I can adjust this in a nice way and you see here it moves around already a little bit. I have done it now a little bit over the top here and you see I affect only this area here. I can limit this, I can expand it and I can change it here. And I can do this for a lot of areas in the picture and then I create a style that works nicely for landscapes when I improve the green or when I have maybe sunsets where I work mostly on this area here, on the warm area. And I get here these chips where I say from this I want to go to there. And I can do this many times until I get my picture style that I want to have. Similar to the landscape or portrait mode here. And this works for all cameras. The raw information has not stored this inside of the information. The JPEG has it. And when I create something like this here, I can load this to my camera, name it wisely and then use it. The RAW will stay untouched again. The JPEG will have all this information in it. And this is of course a dangerous thing to have because I go away from the documentary style of the HDRI towards to an artistic style in the HDRI. And that is not what we like to have. So that concludes nearly the preparation for our little craft that I want to show you to finalize this episode. And we go back to our green board or blackboard. So when we talk about a linear and a linear light in uh, the way I want to talk about this for the HDRI series, then we have always here our little graph. And we have a straight line here. So whatever comes here in terms of input goes then out on this side. If this is 45 degrees and the values on this scale and on this axis or scale is the same, then we can say this goes here to the curve and then out it goes here with the same value. So if that is maybe here 8, then this would be here 8 as well. If this here is 4, then this would be 4 here as well. Okay, this is the power of uh, the curve. If we have now here something like this in it, then this value here would end up here. That would be then 4 with a little apostrophe. And the 8 here, yeah, where it would be? Exactly here. And so off we go. This is then the 8 with the change in it. So huge dramatic changes here. Just uh, this curve makes the 4 and the 8 pretty much in the same way. So this is the introduction and then we come soon finally to the way how it is explained with linear light. This would be here the representation of linear light. Just a straight 45 degree line here. And I draw here my graph into that and if we have the same scale on both axes, then we can say this line here goes then over to our output. And when this is, for example, 64, then this one here would be also 64 in and out. And the truth is that we talk about these numbers and I put them away because we don't care at the moment at numbers, just about the relationship. This area here is always then one stop. And it sounds so simple. When we ta take a look here, we draw here one stop after the other end. And wherever I go here, just up, I create exactly the same value on this side. These sides from here to here are exactly the same as from here to here. The problem that this causes finally to illustrate what that means what linear light means finally and to get the right conception about linear light is 
that each stop here doubles the amount of light. So if I start here and go then to the next, 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 and so on, I can do this 20 times without problems to leave the real world light data. So I can start here maybe with 2, then 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, and 512, 1024, and so on. You see, it goes really, really quick into big numbers. And the distance from here to here is only 2, and here it's 512. But it looks so similar here when we have one stop after the other. And when we have then here the same values, of course, stops by stops, then we get this straight line. It would look completely different if I take now here these numbers in a very straight, normal way. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on. When I take here maybe, let's say we have here 16 on the top, and this would be here 2, then this one here would be 4, 8, 16. So to go here with 2, it would go here, and the 16 by itself is then already here on the top. The 4 in this value is then here, and the 8 yeah, practically stays where it is. And then we can see here we get already this curve inside. And that is how light really works. It goes exponentially up in a log. Log 2 is normally the way it is described. So, and this curve here is then linear light expressed with normal numbers here, natural numbers, and not with f-stops. And exactly here is a little bit the problem when we talk about a linear, because we always have exactly this as the representation of linear in mind. This is very important to understand. I will go into this more in depth in the coming episode of this series. But to make it clear, what we do finally and where our main focus is maybe when we do normal pictures, that is then exactly in this series explained and why we have to take care about linear light very carefully. So to finish up this episode, I want to go again into my data here where I have my camera raw and when I change here this picture into my linear light workflow, means I get into HDRI, then I get something that is exactly along this light curve or a straight line when I go with stops. That's important to understand. And when I change here now something in the picture with my curves here, for example, when I do something like this here and change exactly how I want to have the picture, then all of that is not a linear light anymore. And I could store this in an open EXR file, but the damage done here based on this curve would be stored in the open EXR file in the same way. And it wouldn't be linearized, straightened out when we go with stops again. So just to put something into a 32-bit per channel format, doesn't make it to a linear format. We stay all the time with this straight line when we go with stops or with this curve when we go with natural numbers. And this is maybe a little bit hard to grasp when this is the first time you get all this concept. So I will go again into that in a moment. Thanks for listening. Have fun with it. Bye bye.